Joining me today is Ryan Deming. He's a partner at Monteroso Investments, and the last time we spoke, he was running for a seat on the Bitcoin Foundation's board. Ryan, how are you? I'm doing well, Adam. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. So one of the things that stuck out from your candidacy to me compared to some of the other ones is that you actually have a lot of experience, not on the cryptocurrency side, but on the commodities trading side. And you've worked really closely with regulators for a number of years in that capacity, right? Yeah, that's right. So in our industry, the the commodities industry, the NFA, which is a a self-regulatory organization, works quite closely with CTAs and, and so commodities trading advisors and commodities pool operators. And it's sort of an open dialogue where they audit you semi annually, uh, biannually, that is, about every two years, they audit you. And so we've learned, you know, really how to work with regulators and, and, and what that process requires, the sort of open mindedness that it requires. That's what got me interested in uh, looking at joining the Law and Policy Committee. So that's how I'm, I think, primarily involved now, at least publicly. Uh, is in the Law and Policy Committee for the Bitcoin Foundation. We've been trying to prep this interview for, I guess, about two months now, and it just has has taken a long time. But the timing has been actually quite good because recently there was a pair of FinCEN, that's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, rulings that were a little bit out of left field. They hit on January 30th. I haven't had much of a chance to take a look at them. Have you had a chance to look at them? And can you help me understand what's going on? Yeah, I have. We've actually been expecting them, at least the first ruling, what they're calling R001. We were expecting, we had been in touch with Russ Smith over at Atlantic City Bitcoin. He is uh, the gentleman who originally requested the ruling. And so we were aware that it was coming. Uh, Just the timing just worked out that it, you know, landed right before our scheduled call. There's been a lot of uncertainty about kind of what the regulatory situation is going to look like. And now with retailers like Tiger Direct and Overstock.com coming on board, it seems like this is really an important issue. Did we actually get any clarity in these rulings? So what the rulings touch on, the R001 pertains to miners, or at least is intended to pertain to mining. And really, it's trying to answer the question, under what circumstances does a miner or a mining pool become a money transmitter. They've tried to delineate those circumstances so that people can decide how to structure their their business uh, and their business activities to avoid money transmitter status because we all know registering as a money transmitter is quite expensive in terms of compliance. R002 is quite similar. It just applies the same logic uh, in a different way or not in a different way, but to a different area. It's specifically dealing with traders or people who are engaged in trading on their own behalf. But ironically, it ends up also considering software manufacturers. And we've been talking, I mean, obviously we haven't had too much time to discuss uh, R002. We weren't really prepared for it. We At least those of us on the committee weren't aware that it was even being brewed up. But what it does do is it seems to purposely answer the question, under what circumstances might a software developer become a money transmitter by virtue of their business activities? Based on your preliminary investigation of this, are there any obvious business models out there that used to be okay, but under these new rulings are, you know, off the table? We're actually quite pleased with how this is shaping up. I see it in the opposite way, where there were business models that were clearly in question that we weren't sure if they subjected people to potential registration or not. And I can uh, describe a few of those. And, And these have really, I'd say these two rulings have cleared up what you can do to ensure that you don't fall under that ambiguity and that it's a little bit more clear cut. So let's start with with minors. As of their earlier ruling, last year's ruling that came out in March, it wasn't clear. It, It was essentially implied that unless a miner is using the proceeds from their mining to buy goods or services, that they might be engaging in, in money transmitting just by selling the, the proceeds, just by converting, for instance, Bitcoin into a fiat currency called U.S. dollars. Uh, we weren't sure if that was an unintended result, but it was certainly a severe result, right? If a miner becomes a money transmitter just because they convert their BTC to U.S. dollars, then really, for all intents and purposes, most miners would have to register as money transmitters, as money services businesses with FinCEN. And that seemed like the wrong result. So what R001 has done is it has clarified that and has essentially said, as long as you have a fractional ownership structure, say it's a mining pool that's a limited partnership, for instance, if you are just paying bills on behalf of the limited partnership or servicing debts on behalf of the limited partnership, 
as long as you're doing your paying on behalf of a limited partnership, you're okay. You're not engaged in, in, in money transmitting. Where there is still ambiguity is the question, you know, you have a lot of like cloud hashing, for instance. It's a sort of a industry that's, or at least business that's growing up that's distinct from mining you know, the manufacture of mining hardware and distinct from individuals or even pools that are closely organized mining on their own behalf. The question is, is cloud hashing, is the, the process of mining on behalf of other people and paying out the proceeds where there's no clear legal relationship between the two parties, is that money transmitting? And that's really, I, I would say, the only significant remaining ambiguity. FinCEN has otherwise answered the question. They basically said that how a user obtains virtual currency is not material to the, the legal characterization of whether or not they're transmitting money, right? Whether or not they need to register as an MSB under the BSA. So it essentially is applied the same way for both miners and traders. It doesn't matter how you get the currency. What matters is what you do with the currency. And so long as you, I would say, loosely dispose of the currency on your own behalf in furthering of your own interests or interests of, for instance, limited partners in a limited partnership, you're not engaged in money transmitting. Where people do become money transmitters is if they are using the currency on somebody else's behalf. And so they've made that quite explicit, which for us, it's, a, it's the, best, the best outcome, I think. So this is really a conversation then about agency, right? Uh, if you have the ability to, if you're acting on your own behalf, then you're fine. But if you're acting as the agent for someone else, then therefore you are a money transmitting agent and therefore you need to be registered. Is that about the logic? That's ex I would say that's a, a great characterization of it. So the question is, when are you an agent instead of, of somebody that, that's acting directly on behalf of, say, a pool? If the pool is structured in a way where, where it's, I would say, legally apparent that it's one entity, then there's no real issue. The issue arises when the association is more loose. So if the agent is obviously an agent, then they're perhaps going to run into problems. Okay, so that, I think I agree with you. That sounds like it's actually pretty good. It clarifies a lot of things. It makes it so that it doesn't matter how you got the coins in the first place anymore. It just matters that you have them and how you are going to use them. So that makes it much easier to apply these standards across the board. Let me ask you this. There are a lot of agencies that are all kind of vying to uh, regulate Bitcoin. Do you think that, I mean, how much of a reach does this FinCEN ruling have? FinCEN is really only addressing the immediate question of, you know, how do people become compliant? How do people make sure that whatever their business model is, that, that they're not opening themselves up to potential criminal prosecution because they're not registered with the appropriate agencies under the BSA. And this is all obviously just in the, in the United States. We're not really sure yet what other countries are going to have to say about this. But, uh, but we are now, you know, fairly confident that FinCEN's goal is really, was really, I mean, I think they have accomplished it now, was really to give us enough guidance so that people could, with good faith, go out and establish the compliance procedures that they need or change their business model if they have to so that they are compliant under the regs. In R001, one of the things that FinCEN did was they said that Bitcoin mining itself imposes no obligations on a user to send the mined Bitcoin to another person or place for the benefit of another. So that's the precise rule that they've delineated. It's only once you're sending Bitcoin or virtual currency to another person or place on behalf of a third party that you potentially become a money transmitter. There is one other piece of uh, information that we're kind of waiting on that's getting to be increasingly timely, and that is how, in the United States, the IRS is going to deal with Bitcoin holdings and Bitcoin gains. I'm sure that you have some sort of holdings in Bitcoin, and I'm curious if you think that, you know, that's something that's going to get solved before April 15th, or if we're just kind of going to go through this in limbo. I would be surprised if it does, although I, I have to say that I'm not all that current on what the IRS has to say about this. I, I'm sure that Patrick probably has a pretty fair idea but we haven't in committee meetings discussed this yet. It's tough to get through the morass of potential you know, regulatory issues. We have this whole universe of potential issues and we literally just have to identify one at a time. What we've been trying to get our arms around is this money transmitter issue. And then next we're moving on to 
Money laundering. Money laundering is obviously a big issue because it poses a threat to the entire industry if the regulators perceive virtual currencies as opening up an opportunity for criminals to use the virtual currency to launder money, then we need to help them come up with ways, if in fact that's true, assuming that's true, we need to help them come up with ways to curtail the potential abuse of virtual currencies in the arena of money laundering. So really that's our next focus. All this stuff takes a little bit of time on our end. We're volunteering to do this. One of the things I do want to say though is that With regards to the money transmitting, we're going to publish our position that kind of incorporates these ideas and articulates what we think about them. Early next week, we will post our position on these FinCEN rulings. And then the public will have about two weeks, we're thinking, to give feedback and comment um, on our position. I mean, it's difficult. It's kind of a majority process, and we don't expect to ever reach a consensus, but we'll try to incorporate the public's concerns before we present the position to the board, to the committee, and then the model is supposed to work such that the board will then either affirm our position and then publish it publicly on behalf of the foundation, or they'll propose amendments. So that's kind of how this process will work. One of the things that's interesting about R002, R002 delves into the software question, when does a software provider become a money services business. It looks like even if the software is used in the activity of money transmitting for the software provider's customer. So if the software provider's customer uses the software to then go and transmit money, that does not make the software provider itself a money services business. So there's this clear delineation that FinCEN has created. And this is a bit surprising to us. If you separate these two activities, the money transmitting from the software development side, then the software developer has clearly a a protection against being categorized as a money transmitter and, and requiring money services business registration. That was unexpected. And I think in specifically in the context of ATMs, it's a great result for our industry because what FinCEN has done is they've established this almost safe harbor where if a company is structured so that all that they're doing is providing, for instance, ATM software, the companies that use the ATM software will have to be registered clearly as money services businesses. But the software providers themselves probably won't have to be in that. For us, we think it's a fantastic result. One thing I do want to add also, Patrick Merck's opinion is pretty useful on this and uh, I think it's a good take. What Patrick says about FinCEN's ruling is, you know, regardless of what the consequences of the rulings are immediately and how many gaps there are in them, the good thing that we can take from this is that FinCEN is essentially establishing that if you ask for clear guidance, they'll try their best to give you such guidance. So if you have a business model, you think it's operating in what you perceive to be a gray area, just go ask FinCEN for guidance and they've demonstrated here that they're willing to give it. And that's, I think, the most positive thing that we can take from the rulings. Well, overall, it sounds like it's a very positive ruling. A lot of clarity there. You're right. I mean, the software thing is huge. And it seems like because of the ambiguity about whether or not these uh, wallet applications have been legal, it seems like that is a reason that's really been holding back adoption on platforms like Apple, where they're a little bit risk averse. It seems like this is all just moving in the right direction and that we're continuing to see these rules get settled. So it's not so much that rules are good or bad, it's just that finally there are some rules. Exactly. And they will fill them in for us also as we proceed. So as a as an entrepreneur, your goal really is just to determine what are the existing rules and then try to anticipate maybe where those rules will end up. And in the beginning, it was difficult for anybody to do that. And we actually see our role, the Law and Policy Committee, our, our role is to help people interpret the rules and help people, in fact, anticipate where they're going to end up. We had been able to anticipate R001, the ruling on, on mining. We weren't prepared for R002, but we're pleasantly surprised by it. But going forward, if entrepreneurs, people who are starting their own businesses, if they have questions about where their business model falls, on which side of the fence, is it you know, money transmitting or not, they can do two things. They can come to the foundation's website and look at what we have to say about how we interpret the existing rulings. 
And then if they still have in their minds uncertainty, they can always petition FinCEN for a ruling. And I think congratulations to Russ Smith for doing that in the context of mining, because that one move, I think, did more to clarify the ambiguity and the uncertainty in the industry than, than anything before it. So uh, we're really happy that it, it, the timing of it was, was great for us and for the industry as a whole. I do want to add one other thing, Adam. We are releasing an application in the next couple of weeks for the beta version will come out. In the next couple of weeks, the application will be called A Bit Bizarre and it is kind of a mix between Craigslist and an eBay uh, application for Bitcoin. So it will be a Bitcoin marketplace. Expect that to come, the beta version to be released within the next two weeks. And that's your, and that's a project you're doing with the Monterosa partners. Uh, it actually isn't. That's a separate project that uh, we got involved with originally. My, it was my girlfriend's idea originally, and uh, then we started looking for financing to get it funded. Uh, so it's ended up becoming an entirely different enterprise, separate from Monterosa. But definitely, I think an interesting concept. And I think within the next two or three weeks, it'll be pretty exciting because we'll have something to contribute to the ecosystem that, that doesn't yet exist. So it's going to be pretty exciting for us. Is there a domain for that if people want to find more information or will there be one? There is, yes. A bitbazaar.com and bazaar being spelled B-A-Z-A-A-R, a bitbazaar.com. Ryan Deming, thank you very much for your time and for updating us on this issue. CryptoKit is the world's first Chrome browser Bitcoin wallet. It's the easiest, fastest Bitcoin wallet payment system. With a simple one-click install, it takes just seconds to get your wallet set up. And because CryptoKit finds the address and payment for you, there's no more fussing around or tab switching. CryptoKit is more than just a wallet. It comes with a preloaded PGP encrypted social network, news feeds from Reddit and Google, and up-to-date charts from exchanges. Finally, CryptoKit directory allows you to make two-click payments with any of the BitPay merchants. Once you install CryptoKit, you won't need anything else. For more information or to download CryptoKit, visit CryptoKit.com.